welcome everybody to the third out of 10 of the Stride Speaker Series on Leading Through Adversity. I'm very excited for today's talk because I am sitting here pen in hand, uh, ready to take notes. Uh, this is gonna be an amazing time we're gonna get to spend together. So let me back up, introduce myself and Stride and then talk about the series and I'll quickly hand it over to, to Carrie to, to, to walk us through the pandemic of anxiety, because I know that's what we're here to see. So I'm Debbie Madden. I'm the founder and CEO of Stride Consulting. Uh, quickly, for those that don't know, our superpower is really uh, meeting your tech team where you are and helping you be the best version of yourself through collaborative, iterative, non-dogmatic software engineering and process best practice. So one of the things that Stride is doing throughout these um, volatile and uncertain times is kind of bringing together some of the most wonderful people that we know to bring you topics that are, you know, quite frankly, keeping me up at night. And so today we're going to talk about anxiety. I am a working mother um, in tech and I've always been anxious, <laughs> but uh, it goes with it goes with the job, but I, I definitely find myself being more anxious than normal, and finding my mood swings are are definitely more drastic than than they've ever been in my life. And so I thought this was a really critical topic for us to talk about. Um, for those that are interested in other talks, we've got seven more after today. You can go to strideNYC.com/events. We have Josh Seiden on Tuesday, author of Outcomes Over Outputs, talking about outcomes over outputs. Um, we're all working from home. We don't get to have those water cooler conversations. So really focusing on outcomes is um, a, a really nice way to unlock efficiencies. And then we've got some amazing speakers, uh, six more after that. We've got Diana Larson, Esther Derby, Jeff Gothelf, a lot of, a lot of my favorite people. So, with that, I want to introduce Carrie, and my introduction is not going to do you justice, Carrie, so I apologize in advance, but um, not only was he talking recently with Katie Couric on mental health, but also you are a clinical professor of psychiatry at NYU Langone Medical Center and the founder of the Boswell Group, and so I was just talking to Carrie earlier. He spends most of his time talking to CEOs and leadership teams um, on anxiety. Um, the psychology behind it, and how we can both take care of ourselves and lead our teams. And this, this is actually on your Wikipedia page, Carrie. Uh, the Psychiatric Times in 2014 described you as one of the most sought after psychoanalysts in the world. Uh, so um, that, that is uh, no pressure for us here today. So with that, well, then I'll turn it over to you. Um, I'm sorry, one more quick thing. For those that have questions, we want you to ask your questions. You can do that really in any way you choose. You can unmute yourself and ask a question. You can bring up the participants list at the bottom of your screen, click on the green yes button, and um, Shailen, my coworker at Stride, will call on you. You can chat either to me privately, Debbie Madden, or to everyone, I will read your question out loud. At the end of this, I will have Carrie's email so that you can contact him with your questions offline as well. So many ways to ask questions, and I think I've covered it. So um, with that, if, if you guys want to put your, your Zoom on speaker view, that way you can uh, see Carrie. I will stop sharing this so now we can see um, mainly Carrie's screen and uh, take it away. Thanks, Debbie. I, I appreciate the, uh, the kind introduction. And it's, it's good to be here with, with you and with everybody virtually today. Um, I, I appreciate the way you described my, my uh, work. And I, I think maybe to... Um, to, to get into the comments that I want to make, and I'm going to I'm going to speak for perhaps 15 or 20 minutes, and then we'll really open it up to have a conversation, which I think is is always the most interesting and hopefully the most useful part of this interaction. I really want it to be interactive, but I, I should I should say one or two other things just about uh, about my background and what I do. I think to put my my comments into some context, if that's okay. Um, you know, I, I've had a strange career and, and a very fortunate one from, from my point of view in that I'm a physician, I'm trained as a psychiatrist and as a psychoanalyst. Um, and after being in clinical practice for about five or six years, starting in the late 80s, which dates me, um, I stumbled into the business world in the mid 90s and um, didn't know at the time that it was going to uh, take over my career. And I've, I've been very fortunate and developed a, a practice um, 
started a consultancy called the Boswell Group, where my 14 colleagues and I serve as advisors to CEOs and boards on a range of leadership, management, and culture issues. And, um, and so in a sense, uh, we, don't, we don't talk to them about anxiety per se, but, but certainly having a clinical background comes in very handy in serving as, as advisors, confidants really is what, what we are to, uh, to leaders. Um, in my own practice, I've been, uh, had, had the opportunity to, to work primarily with leaders of large organizations over the last 15 or so years of my career. Uh, publicly traded as well as privately held companies, as well as uh, startups and family businesses. So it kind of runs the gamut in, in terms of different kinds of and scales of organizations, and, and it's not industry specific. So um, I, I like the variety and it kind of keeps me fresh. And the, the, you know, the, the, the secret pleasure of my work is that I get to keep learning. Having said all of that, um, I, I should also say I had the dubious distinction recently of, of uh, becoming president-elect of the American Psychoanalytic Association, and a month later, we, you know, the world sort of shut down, and the, uh, the psychoanalytic profession had to convert, uh, more or less, overnight to working virtually, and so I've been learning a lot, and we've all been learning, uh, and, and one of the things that I would say before getting into the substance of my comments is to say that in I've been doing a fair amount of public speaking virtually over the last three months, and, and I had to chuckle in one of the first ones that I did when Somebody asked me, um, you know, what, what are the best practices for leading through a pandemic? And um, the, the honest answer is, I, I don't know, because um, none of us have ever lived through a pandemic before. And so we're really inventing this as we go. That's not to say that we don't know some things about, about leadership and dealing with the crisis. But even this crisis, uh, you know, is, is different from all others that I, and I, I'm assuming it's true for everybody on this, on this Zoom call, have, have lived through. Having been in New York for 9-11 and for the financial crisis and the Hurricane Sandy, catastrophic as those events were, uh, and in no way to diminish you know, how, how terrible they were, uh, it's different because those events happened on a day. And then, of course, the aftermath in, 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 in all those cases really took years to, to cope with. But the actual traumatic event took place on one day. Uh, as opposed to this one, which is still ongoing, on, ongoing, it's still unfolding. So, um, so it's it's qualitatively and quantitatively very different. And so, I think there there there's a limit to what we can apply from uh, leading through previous crises to this one. So let, let, let's let's get into it. Uh, one of the ways that I have been talking about and framing what is going on is to 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 talk about it as being not just one but two pandemics that were living through. There's obviously the pandemic of the coronavirus. Um, but on top of that, I think there's a pandemic of anxiety. And I'm not just using that as a figure of speech, you know, to describe it metaphorically. I actually think it's, it's real anxiety in a different sort of way than, a, than an actual virus is contagious too. And, and I think there's a high level of anxiety running through society. I'm talking about globally here, uh, and it's, it's high and it's consistent, very persistent levels of anxiety with all sorts of other emotional consequences too, not only anxiety, but, but depression, panic, and so on. We'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute, but the anxiety is the first part that I wanted to speak about. It's stating the obvious to say that, that, that there's a, a high level of anxiety in society, but what isn't so obvious sometimes is you know, what are, the, what are the actual effects of that anxiety on us, and particularly on people who are in leadership roles in organizations? Uh, I'm not just talking about CEOs, I'm talking about you know, people who lead teams, people who lead groups of other people. And, um, and so, so I, I wanna talk about some of the effects of anxiety. And the, the point of talking about that is to raise awareness about it, because it's only if one is aware of it and acknowledges it that, that you can actually do something about it and, and hopefully counter some of the, the, the not so helpful effects of, of anxiety. It's probably worth saying, what are, what are people so anxious about? That perhaps that is stating the obvious. One, of course, is the, the virus itself and people are concerned about contracting it. Um, I should say, sort of full disclosure, I had it uh, early on um, and uh, very fortunate to have, have had a, a, a mild case of it and frankly the anxiety that came along with the symptoms was was in, in retrospect the, the worst part of it i wasn't sick enough to get tested at the time this was back in mid-march although i did get the antibody test recently and, and was positive for the antibody which confirmed that i 
that I had it, but it's a scary thing. Um, and I wasn't in a particularly high, high risk group, um, but just not knowing how it was going to pan out um, was, was anxiety provoking. We're also anxious about uh, the, the, the severe uh, economic and social consequences of this pandemic and the, and the shutdown really of, of many aspects of global functioning. And um, so that's a huge source of anxiety. And I think that will uh, play out for years to come in terms of the, uh, the social and economic consequences. And then the third thing that I would identify as a source of anxiety is the, is the very uncertainty that comes with it itself. You know, not knowing how long this will go on for, uh, not knowing what the world is going to look like as a result of it, not knowing when things will return to even some semblance of the normal that we, that we are, are now looking at through the rearview mirror. So all of that amounts to a, to a high level of anxiety. One of the first effects of anxiety, Debbie, that I wanted to talk about is uh, the effect of anxiety on, on our thinking, on our cognition. Um, it, uh, it, it, it is well known that anxiety can affect our ability to think clearly and to perceive reality accurately. Uh, and hopefully that resonates when I, when I say that with people, that when, when we're anxious just under ordinary everyday anxiety circumstances, you know, we don't always think as clearly as we might want to. It can sometimes distort the way we perceive what's going on around us. And uh, that's understandable. But if you think about it, um, being in that state of mind for an extended period of time can in turn affect the way we make decisions. It can interfere with our ability to make sound decisions. And in this case, really, we're talking about business decisions, but frankly, it applies to uh, personal decisions as well. So uh, that has profound consequences for how we lead through this crisis, because if we're not making sound decisions first for ourselves, and then for those uh, who we care about and are trying to lead and take care of, then uh, we're, we're, we can be in, in, in serious trouble. Um, I should also point out that I, I, I tend to think of anxiety as not something that you either have or you don't have. It's not like a disease that you, know, you, 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 know, you, you, you either you know, have appendicitis or you don't. Anxiety is not nearly so binary. I think of it as existing to varying degrees and existing on a spectrum. The spectrum at one end, um, both uh, spectrums often are, the, the, the extremes are rather maladaptive. Uh, on one end of the spectrum is what I would uh, describe as downright panic. Clearly, that is not ever helpful to somebody who's in a leadership position. On the other maladaptive end of the spectrum is, uh, is what I would describe as denial, you know, burying one's head in the sand and, and saying that you're not really worried about this, or those two say that they're really just enjoying the, the pandemic because they get more time at home. Well, maybe there are some things that, that, that are to be enjoyed about it, and we can talk about that. But but that's a form of denial if, if, if people see this as all good. Um, in the middle of the spectrum somewhere is what I would describe as, a, as an understandable, healthy, expectable degree of anxiety. And of course, there's gonna be a lot of individual variation depending on one's pre-existing personality and how one reacts to other uh, situations that are anxiety provoking. But a, a certain amount of anxiety I wanna point out is normal and actually good in the sense that as long as it's not overwhelming, it can be the impetus for, uh, for, for getting us to, to take action, for uh, thinking about the right things. And so a certain amount of anxiety is, uh, is, is normal, expectable, and actually helpful. It's when it gets to the extremes, these maladaptive ends of the spectrum that I was talking about, that I think we, uh, we have to be, be careful. And, and this is a serious issue. A lot has been written about the, the mental health crisis that's going on in the country and the world. Uh, as a result of the pandemic. And I, I think that's, that's real. I, I think that particularly for those who have pre-existing uh, psychological conditions, but even for those who don't. Um, and we'll, I'll, I'll talk in a moment about, uh, about the consequences for, for all of us. Um, you know, everybody's different. Um, we, we can generalize to a, to a degree. And, and of course, in a, in a conversation like this, it's probably necessary to do that. But, um, but everybody's going to react to the uh, enforced uh, isolation you know, of working virtually. Everybody's going to react to, for, for those who are the you know, so-called essential workers who are still going into, into manufacturing facilities, distribution centers, frontline healthcare workers, of course, you know, what the, the personality that we bring to it will often determine how we react to it. 
from a leadership perspective, it's important to, to really be attuned to the multiple ways that people have of experiencing uh, anxiety uh, because leadership is never one size fits all. Leadership is very situational, again, as a general matter, and it's particularly situational uh, now. So what, what I wanna do next, Debbie, is just to make a few comments, knowing that this is gonna be uh, inevitably incomplete, and but hopefully during the Q&A section, I can answer more specific uh, leadership questions, but just a few general points about what I think are really critical things that leaders need to be doing now starting at the big, you know, from the beginning of this crisis back in, you know, March, um, but, it's, but it's still ongoing, although it's evolving, and I'll, I'll also talk in a moment about how I think it's evolving and how, how my conversations with CEOs, for instance, has, have changed uh, considerably over the course of the, the three months. Some of this, if, you'll have to forgive me or indulge me if it sounds like talking about motherhood and apple pie, and inevitably some of what I'm gonna say uh, will sound like that, but I, I think some of this is so important that it bears repeating. One, one is the is the role of leaders to uh, to take care of themselves first, uh, and that is being attended, take you know, attending to one's own emotional and physical health. Uh, you, if you if you're not looking after your own uh, well-being, then you're you're not going to be in shape to look after the well-being of anyone else. I think some some leaders have a bit of a murder syndrome in which they feel that. You know that they can, um, you know, work 18 hours a day without much consequence and and suffer for the greater good. I think that's, um, frankly, I think that's naive, and um, and so leaders do need to be taking care of themselves. And again, very basic things, you know, getting some exercise, eating, and getting a good night's sleep. Um, you know, just because it's possible for a leader to spend 16 hours a day staring at a screen like I'm staring at now and talking on Zoom for, you know, uninterruptedly practically, uh, just because it's humanly possible to do that doesn't mean it's a good idea. It's actually a terrible idea uh, to do that. I think we need to have breaks. We need to have some semblance of, uh, of other kinds of human interaction. It's really incumbent on leaders to communicate more than they ordinarily would. Uh, most of the leaders who I have the privilege of working with are tend to be good communicators and intuitively appreciate the the importance of that part of their role so you know it's, it's not like they're not communicating at all but I think a greater degree of communication right now is so important in part because we're deprived of the ordinary means of leading which is in-person leading you know the um, what what the, the the secret sauce that keeps organizations functioning and it doesn't matter to me what kind of organization it is are the kinds of ordinary informal human interactions that that we take for granted when we can go into the office every day or even if we go into the office sometimes because some of us are used to working virtually before the pandemic more than others but we're deprived of those kinds of interactions now and so we of course have to rely on and we're very fortunate to have technologies like zoom that we're using here and, and a host of other ones um, but i think we need to think of those as existing not just to be able to have business meetings and of course we we do use them that way and should, but we need to, to think of how we can use these technologies to replicate some of the kinds of social interactions, the informal ones, that really account for the, the creating the cohesiveness of teams that, that really is dependent on creating social bonds. And those social bonds and the ability to make oneself vulnerable um, on the part of leaders, uh, that's, what, that's what creates trust and a feeling of safety in teams. And so we really need to think about how to use these technologies to replicate some of those non-meeting functions. Um, it's really critical. It, leaders also need to communicate frequently about what's going on and there, there are some ways to communicate uh, that, that work and there are some ways that, that really don't. Again, some of this may seem straightforward, but all you have to do is look at the highest levels of leadership in our, in our nation to, to see uh, what I view as, as incompetent leadership. Because um, one of the roles of leaders right now is to um, is to, to be rooted firmly in the reality of the moment, knowing that the reality is evolving with, with new information. So leaders need to be really rooted in reality and tell the truth and don't try to spin things, but also to give hope. And uh, it's, a, it's a fair question to ask, well, if the reality is kind of depressing, um, how do leaders give hope? And that's something that we'll hopefully have a chance to talk about here. But one of the ways is, is by telling the truth and by, by being authentic and not too scripted. I think when leaders um, 
give uh, talks either live via something like Zoom or recorded talks. And I'm a big fan, by the way, of using the visual, not just the auditory or written. All, all modes of communication, I think, should be employed, of course, these days. But, but the visual is so important precisely because we're deprived of those visual cues that we ordinarily get. Um, leaders also need to be highly tolerant, more than ever before, of, um, of imperfections. You know, of the you know the the dog barking in the background of a of a presentation, or kids making noise, um, uh, th those kinds of things I think need to be tolerated and actually embraced. Um, leaders also need to be aware that, that their behavior is highly scrutinized, always, never more so now. And I would actually go so far as to say that that leading through this pandemic will be the defining moment of leaders' careers, of all of our careers, and. Um, being aware of scrutiny is not a bad thing. I'm not saying that to make people, you know, paranoid or feel like they have to be so so extremely careful. Quite the contrary, I think the the high level of scrutiny can be used as a force for good if leaders take the opportunity to to model the kind of behavior in everything that they do now that they want to to, to demonstrate and inculcate in their organizations. You just also need to be careful for those who are leading organizations that are bifurcated, meaning virtual and, and essential workers on site. I think need, that leaders need to be careful not to inadvertently create a kind of two-tier system, kind of a two-class system of workers with those who, um, who are working virtually feeling you know, more privileged over the ones who are, who are on the front lines uh, and working. I think that's a, it's a pitfall that I've seen some leaders uh, unfortunately step into. Um, the consequences of isolation and working virtually, we could have a whole hour just on, on that topic alone. Leaders certainly need to be tuned into it. And at the beginning of meetings, it's a good practice to not just dive into the agenda, but just to go around the virtual room, take five minutes, no more than that is necessary. But just go around and ask people how they're doing. You know, where are they physically? Um, how are they coping with things? And, um, and you, you, know, you get to pick up on how people are, are coping. And if, if something needs to be followed up privately offline, it can be certainly done, but it's also a way of, of encouraging greater vulnerability. A few last comments and then we'll open it up, Debbie, to, um, to questions. Um, one of the um, other things that leaders really need to be doing right now, which some don't feel is intuitive, is, you know, yes, after looking looking out for the health and safety of their employees, which of course needs to be, and their, and their customers needs to be paramount, leaders need to be leading with their values right now. Um, it is so important, and by value, I'm just, I, I mean, talking about the values, living them, um, the uh, really uh, doubling down on the, the culture and values of your organization is something that is, um, or of your team, something that I highly recommend. You know, just other leaders that I've seen, um, I've spoken to a couple of uh, private equity firms to their they've done like uh, calls to all of their uh, portfolio company CEOs and and some of them, particularly in that environment where where they're uh, rather accustomed to having really aggressive, relatively short term financial targets, the CEOs who who skip over the values part and who just go right to performance and drive, drive, drive. Um, they are finding themselves with virtual mutinies on their hands because their employees don't feel that they care about them. And in fact, they're probably right. So, um, so I think now is really the time to put, put the values first and to think of your organization or your team as not just a, a collection of people that does work, but to think of it as a community. Um, the, the, the last thing I'll say before I, I pause and we'll, we'll take some, some questions here, it goes back to this theme of what are the effects of anxiety on us? And I mentioned one about the, the way it can interfere with our ability to make sound decisions. Another, another effect of anxiety is that it um, uh, understandably uh, sharpens our focus of our attention on the immediate and the very short term. You know, it, it makes sense, right? That if you're, if, you're, if you're in a kind of fight or flight mode, you're, you're thinking about, you know, um, do I have enough food in the refrigerator for the coming week? How am I going to get through the next uh, few days work, worth of meetings? How am I going to juggle work with having young kids at home that I'm also trying to educate and take care of? Those are all, of course, totally normal, understandable, short-term concerns. But uh, because of that focusing effect of anxiety on our attention that tends to crowd out longer-term, more future-oriented thinking, um, that's a risk for leaders in particular, because leaders 
need to be doing both. That's not mutually exclusive to think about the short term and the longer term. Uh, we need to be doing both and leaders especially need to be focused on the long term for a few reasons. One, for the obvious reason that it's practically important to be planning for not so much the end of the pandemic. That was a kind of a naive thought that some leaders had earlier that this is all just going to end and that we'll be, it'll be in the, behind us. I, I think current thinking is that it, it, it's not going to end for quite some time, if ever even, at least we'll be living with this for uh, the foreseeable future and we need to get adapt to that. And also we need to find opportunities. That's why we also need to be thinking about the future. We need to find opportunities in this, this prolonged protracted crisis. And there are plenty of opportunities to be found. And um, we also need to start reimagining the future. And I hope we can talk about that in the Q&A because I think that's, those are the most interesting conversations right now are about trying to reimagine the future of society and how it impacts one's organization. But the, there's an emotional reason too for, um, for thinking more out into the future in addition to the, to the very good uh, practical reasons for doing that. And that is that, that, that for leaders to be focusing on the future and thinking about the future and talking about that with their, their, their people, is that's a way of giving hope. And uh, you know, hope can be in, in relatively short supply these days. And frankly, with all the, 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 the racial unrest that's going on in the country, you know, on top of the pandemic, um, you know, I think that, that there's a, the, the hope, hope is even, even more in short supply. And so talking about the future and trying to imagine ourselves and plan for a, a better future as a way of giving employees reality-based hope as opposed to um, false hope, which uh, p people are too smart in general, I think, and see right through. So I'll, uh, I'll stop at that point and um, let's see if we have some, some questions either in the, the chat or people want to just shout them out. I'm, in any way works for me. Yeah, this, this has been great. And I feel like every, I, I can see you as you're sharing with us, um, the tip of the iceberg that each one of these bits of advice we could drill into um, the spectrum of anxiety, reality based hope, don't be a martyr, right? And, 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 and I appreciate you giving us a little taste of all of, <laughs> all, all of that, that was my intention, Debbie. Yeah, and I was like, oh, tell me more. Um, so, I, you know, I want to, you know, if anyone has questions, um, I'll, I'll ask one and, and, and then uh, everyone else um, feel free to shout out or, or put in the chat. But I think, I think for me, one thing that I, I struggle with is um, this idea of taking care of myself and being a martyr. You know, I've been, um, a, you know, a manager or a leader for 20 years. And the story I tell myself is I can always work more. I can always work harder. Um, and I've learned how to deal with it. But now I, um, now that was probably unhealthy before, but net my ability to, 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 um, to push myself has just been cut. I mean, 80, I can't, I can't do it, right? I, and then I struggle with the, the story I tell myself about my capabilities before this versus the reality of, of what I'm able to do now. I don't know if anyone else struggles with that, but it's a real, it's, it's really difficult for me. Do you see other people struggling with yeah. the, yeah, but I used to be able to, so why can't I still? Absolutely, I, I, I think that, um, you know, th this is where denial comes in too. Um, yeah. You know, uh, I, I found this in myself over the three months, um, you know, since really the, the onset of this, or uh, it feels like I've lost track of time. My, my sense of time has gotten warped as a result. But um, you know, just speaking speaking personally, I found that, you know, I was, there, were, there were times I felt, wow, I can be so productive. I don't have to uh, travel anymore. I don't have to even, even in, in New York where I'm, based. I don't have to get in a taxi or the subway. I can be so efficient. And, um, and there's some truth to that. Um, and we are learning that we can do, certainly again, speaking personally, that a, a lot more of my work can be conducted virtually than I had previously assumed was the case. Although I frankly deeply miss in-person contact um, and, and look forward to a day when the world you know, permits uh, more of that again. Um, but uh, but just because it's you know possible to you know to to to, to do so much in, in in so little time without taking breaks, like I was saying before, it doesn't mean it's a good idea. That's that that's one thing. Um, the, um, the, the what's what's also missing sometimes is the need to 
for time for reflection. I, I, I think that I've come retrospectively to appreciate that, um, you know, those half hour breaks from one meeting to another where I would, you know, get in a taxi or the subway uh, and go across town, uh, we're, we're, not, we're not just sort of idle time to, to be in transit, but they were actually time to, it was that time to think. And, um, and so I'm, 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 I would make a real plea um, for, for preserving that. We have to actually be a lot more disciplined to do that now um, because it's just so easy to cram things into your schedule. Um, so time to, time to think and time to reflect um, is also something that, that's underestimated. Right, yeah, you don't even realize even that 15 minutes when you walk to the corner to get lunch or your commute to work where you are alone with your thoughts, those moments, I mean, for me, have just gone away completely. <laughs> so, yeah, and, they're, and they're priceless. <laughs> that's a good tip. I will, I, will, I will try to somehow find, even, even if you can start small, right, find little bits of time. But yeah, no, those, those moments are, are gone uh, now, right? So... Um, I leave this recording uh, and I immediately go into mom mode. I mean, look, five seconds later, I go into mom, right? There is no, there, that's gone. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's yeah. very, Well, that's just to, to talk about mom mode for, for a minute, you know, the, 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 obviously that is a very common challenge right now. Um, it, it, it's just juggling being a parent and, and trying to be productive at work. And um, it's part of what I was arguing earlier uh, that CEOs need to be uh, more tolerant of, of, the, of the, the challenges in themselves and in the people who work for them about, you know, how hard it is to juggle parenthood and, and work. And I think that, um, you know, we, we need to assume that people who are juggling those kinds of challenges really do want to be productive. You know, the, I've, seen, I've seen CEOs think, well, people are just kind of getting away with, you know, with something, they're, they're at home, so they're slacking off. I, I actually find that an offensive perspective. Uh, it, it's it's not true, and um, so so one permutation is yours that you know having having kids uh, at home and also being a leader. Another is the challenge of isolation that brings with it a whole host of challenges. The you mm -hmm. know, protracted isolation is, is is very challenging. Another common challenge is people who are living in relatively close quarters with other bigger people um, or smaller people. It doesn't matter who. Um, who are, who are deprived of privacy and human beings, you know, need privacy too. So it's the extremes. People are, are devoid of privacy or people have too much privacy if they're living in isolation and that has its consequences. So, and then, and then, and then there are all the people in between who are, who are trying to juggle being responsible, caring parents with also with, and being diligent workers. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I want to ask the group, um, I, I feel like, you know, I can, I, I feel like I'm having a personal um, session with Dr. Carey right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to continue to do it. Um, does anyone, does anyone want to jump in? Um, I, get, I see uh, Leonard Fishman. I, have, I have one related to what Debbie said about um, kind of like CEO martyrdom. And I, I've always found like as a CEO, when things get the most intense, like my natural instinct is to like, dig in on everything and now like work remote is compa like compounded that and I wonder if you have advice on how to give like you know managers reporting to the CEO like more room while also giving the CEO you know the information and perhaps the influence um, you know that you know that you also feel you need yeah well, the, 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 the fact that you asked the question, obviously I, we, you and I haven't met, but the fact that you asked the question suggests that you, you already have a, a, a higher degree of self-awareness about this problem and you're seeing it or maybe experiencing it in your, in your own uh, work. Um, you know, um, leadership is good, good leadership and good management. By the way, those things are not synonymous, right? Leaders are um, the, those who set the, the vision and the strategy and who are the, the, the people who inspire the, uh, the, the, their, their people, their teams. Um, managers, that there's no value judgment in what I'm saying at, at, at all, but because we need both good leaders and good managers. Managers are those who, you know, in effect, keep the trains running, who are, who, who are more organized, who run good meetings, um, who make sure that, that, that the I's get dotted and the T's get crossed. Um, the, what, what it takes to be a good manager and, and or a good leader um, in ordinary times 
is frankly the same as it is now. The, the, the situation is different. Um, the sense of urgency may be uh, very different um, and the challenge of working virtually adds uh, lots of new twists to it. But the fundamentals, I think, of leadership and, and good leadership and good management are, have not changed over, over the millennia, much less over the last three months. So I, I think those lessons need to be learned or at least sought out. Um, that's one thing I would say. Um, the other thing is that you know, just because something is possible doesn't mean it's a good idea. It's sort of similar to what I was saying before about spending you know, all day glued to your screen on Zoom, uh, not a good idea. Just because it's possible for, um, for CEOs or, or leaders of teams to find their people so easily now. Um, nobody's really on vacation, nobody's traveling, and nobody's out of the office. Everybody's at home uh, with, with, and they're sort of tethered to their devices. Um, but that doesn't mean it's a good idea to just, uh, you know, call a meeting whenever you want to and, and, and reach out and, and, and dive into the details that you wouldn't ordinarily do because the, you know, you know, guess what? The same kinds of unintended consequences will occur like the, the profound disempowering of the people that you actually have hired and wish to delegate a lot to. Uh, they're they're going to feel uh, like you're undermining their, their ability to, to, to fulfill their potential. So I think these things need to get talked about um, in the same way that they had been before and perhaps with greater, with, with greater urgency because it's so much easier to kind of violate the, uh, uh, the, the norms of, of good leadership and good management. Thanks. Thanks, Leonard. I appreciate the question. Um, does anyone else want to jump in uh, via message or verbally? I just have a basic question. It's Alyssa Glickman. I'm not sure if you could see me. Yep. Hi. It's, um, yep. So I'm not, a, I'm not a business leader. I'm a psychotherapist and coach. And one thing I'm just wondering about. Great. Is, Happy to have you here with me. Thanks. thanks. Um, are, are business leaders and, you know, are they reaching out like, for, you know, for help on this, you know, sudden huge change that they have to deal with personally? And in terms of all the personnel issues and the anxiety, as you're talking about, are, you know, are, is there a sense that people are, you know, asking for help? Like, how do I adjust? I mean, is there sort of like an on mass need for this that's been coming through? I would imagine it would be, but maybe it's just too soon. I'm not sure. Uh, no, I think it's, I think it's, I think it's very real. And it's not too soon. Um, I, I have found that in my conversations with CEOs over the last three months, um, and I and I don't think it's just because they're talking to me and I'm trained as a shrink, you know, uh, my basic training. Uh, they are saying that 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 the emotional consequences of this pandemic, broadly defined, whether it's the the, the effects on individuals, on on their entire organizations, on their culture's ability to remain coherent, or on teams' abilities to remain, um, you know, cohesive and functional, or on their customers. Um, th there's, there's a sense that that is uh, perhaps the, uh, the biggest challenge of this pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, the, you know, the, the emotional consequences and social consequences of the economic devastation that's going on around the country. Mm -hmm. um, that is enormous. Right. Um, and I think it's, um, you know, it, and, and while I say to the leaders that I work with that you know, and I'm, I say it slightly facetiously that their, that their role isn't to turn their company into a mental health clinic. Um, uh, but I think that, that, you know, for those who really do need help, those resources need to be made available. I think the therapeutic community has probably never been busier. Um, but I think it's, but I think, I think some of the support, you know, can be had from within if uh, leaders are attuned to the need for it. So, um, you know, I, I, I think, I, I, I think there's some, one other thing that I would mention, and I mean, there's so much we could talk about with regard to your your question or your comment, which is that the the exercise of trying to reimagine the future, which I'm saying is so vital right now, and that, that leaders need to be putting together, you know, smart, creative uh, people in a safe environment to, to to try to think about what is the future going to be like. And I think anybody, by the way, anybody who tells you that you know that they have this crystal ball and they know what the future is going to be like, I would frankly I just dismiss them because I, th I think that's impossible. We have to live with a, a degree of not knowing. Yeah. Uh, but in any event, a, a, a big part of reimagining the future is, um, is, is, is a behavioral component, you know, because this is going to change so much of individual behavior. You know, 
um, in, in every walk of life. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's really helpful how you talked about like bringing up, you know, the leaders, you know, that they're also going through it and they're also not sure just how you started out. You know, I really don't know what to say. You know, I've never done this before kind of thing because I just think people are, there's so much uncertainty and um, if we could just talk about it up front, you know, if the leaders can just talk about that, but also give comfort at the same time. Um, in, yeah. in and, and the paradox is before before we go to the next question, just the, I, I just add one last comment, if I may, which is that the the paradox is that one of the things that can be very comforting is to is precisely to acknowledge that you don't know. That that may seem counterintuitive to some people. Um, but I, I'd rather have a leader who tells me that they don't know and that they're going to try to figure it out with me than, than to have some leader who comes across as so certain, I would describe it as pathologically certain, frankly. Um, and, um, and that actually gives, that makes me more anxious. So that's the paradox right now. Yes. You know what Go I ahead. wanted to say, um, Alyssa, Alyssa, uh, you may, you, what you made me think of is um, I, I'm also a coach and, and I have my own coach. And I haven't um, reached out to her since February, uh, just because I, I haven't felt like up, up for it, up to it, you know? Like she's the kind of coach who pushes me uh, to reach goals and I just have not um, been up for that. I wonder how uh, scientifically interesting that is. <laughs> um. I, well, I, I, I'm not sure if scientifically is exactly the, the word for it, but it is interesting. Uh, it's, it's, it's emotionally interesting to me um, uh, because, uh, again, I, I don't want to get into the, the nature of your, your uh, relationship with your coach necessarily, but, um, but I would think that a, a, a good coach would be psychologically attuned to what's going on right now uh, because maybe the thing is not to be pushed right now. Even if even if being pushed under you know pre-pandemic uh, circumstances had been very helpful to you, I, I don't know, but um, but 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 being pushed to what right now, um, you know, I I, I think uh, you know what what is the if the, if the goal of a coaching relationship is to again loosely defined enhance your performance, uh, it, it may be that uh, that what what the kind of encouragement that you or others might need now is not about you know working harder or pushing yourself more, but but to take more time to be reflective, for instance, or to you know, to, to step back and, 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 and see this, this extraordinarily challenging time that we're going through is also a time for taking stock in one, what really matters to you in your life. Um, I, I've certainly found that, that this has been um, you know, very important uh, for me personally, you know, to, to ask questions about, um, you know, what, what am I doing? You know, what, what, what really matters to me? And, um, you know, uh, if, if some of the things that I'd taken for granted, like lots of travel all over the place and just ju jumping on a plane at the drop of a hat, um, I'm not sure I can do that so readily anymore, nor do I want to. And, and, and much less is it, is it a socially responsible thing to be doing with the same level of abandon? Oh, thanks for that. Sure. All right, I wanna, we've got enough time for a few more questions. And again, um, um, if folks want to contact Carrie after this, we have his contact information and also we'll get the recording afterwards. So you can, you can definitely find him or you can reach out to me um, and uh, Debbie at strideNYC.com and I can put you guys in touch. But um, are there any other folks that wanna ask questions live at this point? All right, I have one more me, question. Oh, go ahead, Carrie. Go and ahead. I'll make one more point too. Um, okay. um, which is, and, and it, the, the, the last person's question, which I really appreciated and liked, um, just makes me think of one other uh, thing to put, put a sharper point on my urging everyone to, to take this time to, to do some reflections on what really matters um, to them personally. Um, one, one, one other related thought that, that has been coming up in a lot of the conversations I've been having recently is, uh, is to look, you know, what are the silver linings in this? I mean, there's, there's plenty of bad, um, and there's no, no, no use in, in, uh, denying that, um, you know, people's people or people have died. People have, uh, lost their jobs and all sorts of hardships. The, everything, including a virus for God's sakes has gotten politicized. Um, I, I find that tragic. 
um, and, and we're living in such divisive times. But, but are there silver linings or can there be? And I, I think the answer is yes. I think we may uh, be seeing some uh, like greater shows of kindness, uh, greater shows of empathy to those whose who's, who's pre-existing difficult lives are even more difficult now. And, um, you know, because I think the, you know, the, 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 the crisis has, has exposed so many fault lines in society. And I think that if we uh, come, reluctant to say come out of, to my earlier point, but come, but you know, tra traverse this uh, with a greater sensitivity to um, to those who are a lot less fortunate. Um, I, I think that could be a, a silver lining. I, I think greater respect for for the environment, uh, you know, for the you know, for the climate. Um, frankly, a greater regard for the for the role of science in society, for science, medicine, health related fields. Um, what what worries me is the is the 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 nearly boundless human capacity for denial. And so, if, you know, when things start to get better, more, you know, uh, sort of, so to speak, normalized, um, will, will some of these lessons that seem uh, acutely real now, uh, you know, be, start, start to fade in our awareness? And I sure hope not. And I think that, I think that one of the roles of leaders is to have a kind of moral imagination and, and a sense of moral grounding in their leadership roles. And, and I think leaders can help to keep some of these lessons learned alive and maybe change some of the, not just uh, the practices, but even some of the structures of society as a result of this uh, really global uh, calamity. So that's, that's just another comment I wanted to make, but I, I do think it's an important one to, to, to keep in mind. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, my, my last question, uh, as you were talking, made me realize that, um, I instinctively um, communicate with people based on the, um, I, I think, I don't know if it's true, I think of myself that I have high EQ and I can read someone's body language. And actually, I, I, until hearing you talk about several topics, I didn't realize how much I relied on that. And for me, everyone's in the same box now. Everyone's in the same square and when the box goes away, I don't know if you're okay. Um, I don't know if you can't get out of bed in the morning. I don't know if you like, you know, didn't get a haircut for six months because no one's getting a haircut. You know, like all the all the visual cues are are gone. Um, how do you know if someone on your team is kind of, you know, well, do you do you do you verbally get, go around and ask everybody? You know, like what's the what do you put in place of that? Yeah. It's a good question. I, 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 first of all, I wouldn't. I'm not sure. I entirely agree that they're gone. I would say they're different. Uh, but, the, but, but, but that's why I was you know, strongly advocating the use of these visual technologies over the phone. Although it's also, I, I'm very sympathetic to needing to mix it up sometimes too, because it can be so exhausting mm -hmm. being on Zoom all the time. And so some phone calls, uh, obviously people are going to email anyway. Um, I think is, uh, is 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 a good idea. Um, but I do think you can pick things up. Um, you know, on, on Zoom about how people are doing in terms of, you know, if, if you're someone like, like me too, actually, who relies on those, those visual cues all the time. But, but, but you, you answered your own question, I think, which is yes, ask people how they're doing. Um, you know, I think this is um, sort of forcing us in a good way to be more verbal, both in terms of asking and, and responding. Um, you know, you know there's, there's, there's been so much uh, negative publicity about Zoom, although I think it's been fading away. Uh, initially, it was, it was about the, you know, the uh, Zoom bombing and other security-related breaches of Zoom. I, I think some of that has fallen away. Frankly, I find Zoom to be fantastic. I'm a huge fan um, with all the problems that, that, that you're talking about in terms of the, that it's different. You know, it's hard to be unaware of the fact that, that this conversation that you and I are having right now is technologically mediated, even though I can see you, but, you know, I'm, I can also look th three inches to either side and, you know, see my, you know, the, the screen of my laptop. So mm -hmm. you, you can never completely get away from, from that. Sometimes the phone feels less technologically mediated because it's just the sound and we're more accustomed to that. Um, but in any event, I think, I think, I think you can still, you know, pick up a lot on, on Zoom. The other thing that's different about it is that, um, you know, I've never been to your house, Debbie, but I can see over your shoulder and see some of the art behind you and the furniture and look out the glass. And uh, so there's there's a kind of intimacy mm -hmm. that, that that it's that's another paradox. There's there's intimacy at the same time that there's greater distance. Uh, it's one of the reasons why, by the way, 
say the you know the, the 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 one of the most common terms of the of the pandemic that has entered our lexicon is social distancing. Of course, uh, I've always felt that that was a misnomer. It should be physical distancing because it's we're physically distant here. Uh, but hopefully, we, we should we, what we should be striving for during the pandemic is social closeness and mm -hmm. physical distancing. So, yeah. Anyway. That I think yeah, I, I, when people started talking about that term, I don't think they thought it was going to be the number one phrase. You, like, you know, I, all of a sudden, everyone's talking about it. <laughs> but yeah, yeah, it is, it is an interesting, it is a phrase for sure. So, all right, what I, what I wanted, what I want to do now, this is, you know, my Zoom. Um, I think I did it. All right, better. I'm getting better. Last time I did this, it didn't go so well. All right. So. <laughs> Um, all right, so I am sharing my screen right now. I just want to kind of sum up here and say a wonderful, tremendous thank you to Dr. Kerry Sulkowitz. Uh, Kerry, thank you for your time, your insights, um, and your ability to teach us so much in such a short amount of time. I personally have a ton of questions for you. Um, and I did throw your email up there for those that want to reach out to you, you. And also, if people want to email me directly, and then next week we've got Josh outcomes over outputs and um, have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you so much. And I appreciate everyone taking their busy time to, to stay with us today and enjoy the nice weather out. Take care, everybody. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks so much for having me. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Debbie. Thanks everyone. Bye. Thank you.